those first four reflections that we chanted just now were subject to aging, illness, death. These things are unavoidable. We haven't gone beyond these things. We're subject to separation from all the things that we love. It would seem to confirm that statement that you often hear about the Four Noble Truths, especially the First Noble Truth. The truth of suffering is that life is suffering. But the Buddha never said that. And those f reflections don't stop with the first four. They include the fifth, that we're the owners of our actions. In the same way, there's more to life than just suffering. If life were suffering, how would you put an end to suffering? You'd have to put an end to your life. It would not be a very useful teaching. And there's no place where the Buddha ever said that. When he talks about his own memories of his past lives, included not only memories of the pains of those lives, but also memories of the pleasures. Life has its pleasures as well as its pains. Even the five aggregates form, feeling, perception, thought fabrications, and consciousness. The Buddha says they do have their pleasant side. They're not all suffering. So his understanding of life, his understanding of the world, had a lot more nuance and was a lot more useful. He didn't say life is suffering when he made his shortest explanation of suffering. He says it's clinging to the five aggregates. The five aggregates themselves are not suffering. They may have pain in the fact that they are inconstant and stressful and not self. But that pain doesn't have to weigh down the mind. It weighs the mind down because we cling to these things. It's the clinging that is the, the real suffering. And when the Buddha gives us that analysis, it's helpful. Because he not only says that it's clinging, but he also says what to do with it. He says, try to comprehend it. That means understand, why is it that you cling to things that are suffering? Why are you doing this? Suffering is something you do. It's not something you simply are on the receiving end of. It's an activity that you're engaged in. The word for clinging can also mean to feed. We feed off of these aggregates. And keep in mind that the aggregates are not things, they're activities. We find delight in doing these activities. After all, how do we find ourselves? We define ourselves usually around what we feed off of, both physically and emotionally. And we need these aggregates to engage in the fe feeding. There's form, there's the form of the body that needs to be fed, and also the form of things outside that can feed the body. There's the feeling of pain that comes with hunger, and the pleasure that comes when we've been able to satisfy the hunger. There's our perception of what kind of hunger we have, and also what kind of objects out there we can feed on that would satisfy that hunger. And there's fabrication, our plans on how to find the food we want, and then once we've found it, what we do with it. And then there's awareness, consciousness, which is aware of these things. These are the activities that are very intimately bound up in our act of feeding, again, physically and emotionally. And so it's in the way we feed that we suffer. Now the Buddha's not saying, well, just stop feeding. He says, learn how to feed in a more skillful way. Train the mind to feed off of the path, like we're doing right now, trying to feed off of your practice of concentration. And it will ultimately lead to a place where you don't need to feed anymore. Not that because you've told yourself to stop feeding, but simply because you've found something that doesn't require feeding. And that there covers all Four Noble Truths. Because life isn't just suffering in the first noble truth. There are four noble truths about life. We always have to keep this in mind. The Buddha was not a pessimist. 
Yamanuri is teaching a path to the end of suffering. He teaches us how to comprehend our suffering, how to understand its cause, how to let go of its cause, so we can solve the problem. There's nothing pessimistic there at all. When he talks about suffering, he's like a doctor who asks you about your illness, asks about where does it hurt, what are the symptoms. Because the doctor wants to know the symptoms so he can find the cure. He's not being negative, saying everybody's got to be sick. But the fact that you're going to see the doctor means you realize that you've got an illness, and he's there to help you. He's not afraid of talking about the symptoms because he's got a cure. In the same way, the Buddha is not afraid of talking about all the many aspects of suffering in life and seeing suffering in areas where we often try to deny it. The reason that he's not afraid is because he's got a cure. And the fact of the cure is something very positive. Early on in my time with the John Fuang, he mentioned his debt to a John Lee by saying that he was in debt to a John Lee because a John Lee had showed him the brightness of the world or the brightness of life. And one of the obvious meanings, of course, is that the brightness was that there is an end to suffering. But it's more, all formidable truths are bright, a bright part of life. Because after all, when we suffer, what happens? We, we're confused, we're bewildered, and we're looking for a way out. And here the Buddha is offering us that way out, offering us an end to our confusion, an end to our bewilderment. He doesn't say anything general and unhelpful like life is suffering. He says, suffering is the clinging. It's something you're doing, and you're doing it because of your craving and ignorance. And the craving is something that can be put to an end, so that means there is an end to suffering. The explanation of suffering, the explanation of craving, this cause of suffering, that's part of the brightness of the world. It ends our confusion. It ends the darkness we have around these things. In the same way, the path. It is possible through our efforts to put an end to suffering. That's a very bright teaching. It gives us hope. That we're not doomed to keep on suffering, or we don't simply have to say, well, whatever pleasure there is in life, there's going to be some suffering, so we might as well learn how to accept it. Because after all, what's the alternative? That's a very pessimistic teaching. The Buddha is saying there is an alternative that's not death. There's an alternative that the total end of suffering, and it's within our abilities. The fact that there's this teaching in the world, that's part of the brightness of the world. So make yourself confident. As the Buddha said, other people have done this, you can do it too. That type of thinking, he says, counts as a kind of conceit. But it's a useful conceit on the path. Conceit is one of the problems. In fact, we practice for the end of conceit. But what is conceit? It's the fact that you're comparing yourself with other people. Altogether, there are nine kinds of conceit. In other words, you're equal to someone else, and you say either that you're equal, or that you're worse, or you're better. Or you may be worse than someone else, and you say that you're equal, or worse, or better. Or you're better than they are, and you say that you're equal, or worse, or better. In other words, the problem with conceit is not whether it's an accurate comparison. It's the fact that you're comparing. And the problem of suffering is something that you can't really compare. How do you know how much someone else is suffering? You begin to realize when you really tackle the problem of suffering, you take the Buddhist teachings on the Four Noble Truths seriously, you realize we're not here to compete with others. Because suffering is something that we feel. We feel our own suffering. We can't feel anyone else's. So comparing yourself is a useless thing, except for that one comparison. Other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. Why can't I do it? 
that kind of conceit is something you actually want to actively cultivate. And that too is part of the brightness of the world. We live in a world not only where other people have done this, but they've shown that it's something that anybody can do. So look at the parts of your mind that get in the way. And realize, okay, those are the darkness of the world. Those are either the cause of suffering or the suffering itself. So learn how to see them that way, as something to be comprehended and something to be abandoned. So here we are. We have a path that sets out very clearly what the problem is, what the cause of the problem is, and what we can do to put an end to it. That ends our confusion. And not only does the Buddha analyze the problem, but he says this is the duty with regard to each of these truths. This, the truths ha carry responsibilities, they carry paths of action in them. You might say that they're performative truths. They don't simply sit there. They're meant to have an impact on your mind, an impact on your actions. And they give you clear guidance. This is what the Buddha's statement was about any teacher's duty with regard to a student, is to give the student a clear idea of how to figure out what is skillful and what is not skillful, and give the student the teaching that allows the idea of what should be done and what should not be done to make sense. After all, if you believe that suffering was inevitable, there was nothing you could do about it, well, then saying, what should I do? It, even the question wouldn't make sense. Or saying that you're suffering because of some past action that you cannot change, that doesn't give you any, any guidance as to what to do. It sounds like all you have to do is just accept, which is not what the Buddha said. Well, the reason we're suffering is not only because of past actions, but more importantly, it's because of present actions, and the present actions make all the difference. So in that case, it does make sense to ask, what should I do? And then from there, look at the Buddhist guidance. So the fact that we have these teachings means that there is brightness in the world. Life isn't just suffering. Life has suffering in it, but the problem isn't life. The problem is the activities of the mind. Knowing that gives you focus. This is why we focus on the breath as we meditate, because the breath is very close to the mind. As you get to know your breath better, you get to know your mind better. In a way that allows you to see, this is where you're adding that unnecessary suffering, and this is how you can stop. So all of that teaching is part of the brightness of the world. Not only the fact that there is an end to suffering, but we can understand it for ourselves, act on that understanding. And find the brightness that the Buddha found, and that all the other noble disciples have found. And that's the brightest teaching there is.